What if somebody else was given ultimate power in the Marvel Universe and used it to murder Thanos and fix things in the opposite of removing half the people? This is the story of Infinity Wars, and this is the Comic Story and Channel, where we take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues within comic books, and we break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. We then read them dramatically back to you. All alterations to the panel's text and images are to prevent copyright problems, and all art is owned by its respective companies. Infinity War is the story that came out a couple of years ago, and basically a villain known as Requiem had a plan that would involve removing Thanos and doing what he wanted to do, but a little differently. The way it works is they did three issues of the main storyline, and then they did a bunch of Infinity Warps storylines, and then they finished up the main storyline. All of that is here today in a full story, which took us multiple months to create, so I hope you guys enjoy. An omnipotent city, a voice asks why. Why do I remember some of these stories differently than these books? Loki pushes the scrolls away, standing up, stating that there is no end to his torment. Why is it the ever the hero of the story? It's the same stories over and over again, each with a slightly different outcome, but none of which are me on the throne. There must be someone behind this. But before Loki could go on, a large older woman with braids tells him, yes, yes, someone is always behind it. Well, Whatever it is, good luck with it. My library is closing. Loki shouts, I am the Prince of Asgard. Have I been away so long that they do not remember me? The woman tells him that she does, my lord. He may call her Flower, one of the Asgardian tome keepers, and he is lucky that she even let him in here at all. Flower grabs Loki by the horns, pulling him out, and Loki says, How strong are you? Flower then says that it's because she is near her books and scrolls, and it is giving her the strength of her ancestors. Now out with you! As Flower throws Loki out of the library, Loki tells her to wait a moment. Someone is playing a trick on him. Some of those stupid books are wrong. None of them make sense, and it's driving me mad. Different universes with the same people? Why? Flower grabs Loki by the arm, telling him that she remembers something about that over here. Loki asks, You recall a story where I was the hero? This better not be a trick. How did you come to be with all of these Asgardian books anyway? Flower then starts looking through the book, stating that Freya thought keeping all their knowledge in one place was not one of Odin's smarter decisions. Flower then pulls out a book, stating that this one is about the Similian strife in a war of worlds, though she's never read it. Loki takes the book and he begins to flip through the pages until he sees himself, but the pages afterwards have been ripped out. He asks, what the hell is this? The story begins with me, but most of it is gone. And Flower shouts, grabbing her sword, asking, what? I'll find the knave and make them redraw the pages before I slay them. Loki calms her, stating, not if I do it first. But what do you know of this tale? Flower thinks back, stating that the only thing that she can remember is that it had something to do with the quarry way out at the end of space. Loki asks her, the god quarry? And Flower tells him that it is what the people call it now, but long ago it was known as the quarry of creation. The gods are just the top sediment. Loki then says that he shall go to the god Quarry, and Flower laughs, stating that one does not go there. That place is protected by the Elder Witches. Loki begins to ask if she would be so kind as to pass on the knowledge of these witches, and Flower grabs Loki by the wrist, telling him that she is missing her book, Gather Fellowship. Flower then pushes Loki out, and Loki tells her, Wait, is that really what you're doing tonight? Perhaps you would like to accompany me to the god, er... Cory of creation. She begins to close the door but stops, and then says that she always wanted to travel. Perhaps it is her chance to write her own tome. Meanwhile, in the soul world, Adam Warlock flies through sensing that something is different. The bright utopia of the soul world is gone. As if something is draining it, the souls that dwell here don't seem to notice. A short while later, Adam visits the Sanctum Sanctorium to see Doctor Strange, the current owner of the Time Stone. Doctor Strange sighs, stating that no one ever stops here for a visit. Adam, the stones were destroyed. And Adam says that he is not so sure the stones can be destroyed. The Time Stone? Do you still have it, Strange? Doctor Strange asks, You're not thinking of assembling the stones, are you? And as Adam starts to say no, Strange stops him, telling him, Good. There's something I picked up in my most recent travels. The ropes of designed nomads. Tethers capable of spanning dimensional doors. But before we leave, there's one question that I must ask. How did you find the Soul Stone? Adam tells him that he retrieved it from Ultron, where he had some help. The portal to the Soul World is opening after you. Doctor Strange tells him, no, you should be the one to take the first step. See if the situation has changed within the stone. And Adam tells him very well and he begins to head through the opening. Doctor Strange then says, also, when you returned, I will expect to hear why you forgot to mention that you were just with Kang. One can still sense the tachyons. Adam continues to pass through and Doctor Strange asks, how is it? And Adam tells him that it's beautiful. And Doctor Strange then asks, really? And Adam tells him, no, 
Wait, someone's coming. Just then, two people begin to run by, and Adam stops them asking what's going on, and one person yells that it approaches. Adam looks back and sees a giant creature walking toward him. But as he attempts to fight it, he can feel his powers beginning to fade. Dr. Strange then shouts, asking what is happening, and Adam calls back, Do not enter! Dr. Strange sighs, stating that now he kind of has to, and he sends a projection, leaving his physical body on the outside. As he enters the portal, he yells, By the horror, he hosts! And he sees Adam being ripped apart. The projection flies back to Dr. Strange's physical body, and he says that he really had hope to keep this a secret as he pulls out the time stone. Time begins to rewind, and Dr. Strange tells his former self, just as Adam entered, to pull him back out. Dr. Strange then heads into the portal, telling the past Adam to return, and that Adam asks, what is it? Dr. Strange looks up at the creature, stating that it's something new. Now run! Time begins to realign itself, and Adam says that he had the time stone but didn't tell him. And Dr. Strange tells him that he failed to say that Kang brought him back to the present. Adam then asks, what was that? And Dr. Strange pours himself a glass, stating, a reason to drink. He takes a sip of his drink, stating that when Gomorrah visited not long ago, she showed him some of the soul world through her dreams, but it's worse in sense. Perhaps the soul stone would be safer with him, where he can make arrangements too. Adam stops him, telling him that he's not planning on assembling the stones, is he? Because the soul stone is his responsibility. Doctor Strange pauses and then asks, What did Kang want in return for your help? And Adam tells him, The soul stone. Doctor Strange looks back, telling him, Goodbye, Adam. But as Adam begins to leave, he calls back that Kang won't be the only one looking. He will come. And as Doctor Strange watches Adam fly off, he quietly says, Thanos. Also, during this war over Chitauri Prime, that man is planning on coming. The man who does not fear death because he has seen the future and met the monster that he is to become. However, he will not become that. He is Thanos, lord of all that there is and conqueror of the Chitauri homeworld. Hear him, for the Infinity Stones are being gathered. Their war bringing couldn't even manage to pick up the Power Stone. The stones will be his once again, and as they were once before. They are his every reality. Thanos shouts to the Chitauri, telling them that he will rise and wage war upon his enemies while he crushes the ones who wield the stones. None shall oppose him. And just then, Thanos is stabbed in the back. As the sword is pulled out, Thanos asks, Who dares? And as he looks upon their face, he laughs, stating, I wondered what you would show up. No matter, that blade I know is designed well. You're here to conduct my requiem with it. The hooded figure tells him that he is always so grandiose. We are here to kill you, and with one swing of the sword, Thanos' head falls from his neck and onto the floor, staring up at the figure. As life begins to fade from him, he tells himself that this is a fine death. The future that he dreaded is no more. As the light begins to leave his eyes, he knows that he has been made whole. One of the Chitauri from the crowd shouts that by the rules of combat, they are theirs to command. And the figure tells them that they have one need of them, and that is to die. The figure pushes the button on their waist, and suddenly a green gas shoots out, spreading and killing all of those that inhale it. And as the last of the Chitauri fall, the figure tells themselves that they may not be the one who conducted his requiem, but their work is far from over. The figure slams the sword onto the ground, stating that now their future is blank, and now the past is dead. The figure looks at Thanos' broken gauntlet and stomps on it until there is nothing left. Peter Quill sits at a table in another neon-lit bar somewhere in the galaxy. A piece of me is missing, Gamora tells him standing over his table. Peter knows. He's sorry. Yet this brings simple glares from Gamora. That's all he has to say? She reaches out, grasping the case that contains the Power Stone. It's soft purple light glowing through the clear plastic sides. With this power, they could force the issue. She could acquire the Soul Stone, opening it up to reunite with her missing piece. Peter takes a sip of his drink. That sounds like a good way to get a lot of people killed, Gamora. She understands. Yet, she asks a favor of Quill, that he doesn't go to the meeting of the Infinity Watch that Stephen Strange has called on Earth. Peter doesn't have a choice, though. It has to be protected. They all do. If joining a new Infinity Watch is the way to do it, well, Peter will. Gamora leans down, kissing Peter for a brief moment before returning the case to the table and walking away. Star-Lord wastes no time, exiting the bar, joining his friends Rocket Raccoon and Groot. They knew that Gamora wouldn't join them. Earth. A portal opens up near Central Park as a bicyclist is struck down by an oncoming car. He freezes mid-air, though, as Iron Lad freezes time when he steps through with Adam Warlock and Drax the Destroyer. It is unknown how important this person must be, but Iron Lad still takes the time to save him by dragging him away from the accident. 
Moments later, a group of limos arrive, expelling the second group to arrive to the meeting. The group of villains, led by Bullseye and Turk, move quickly into the park. They're late. Elsewhere, a young jogger and her dog are startled as a spaceship lands. Star-Lord, Rocket Raccoon, and Groot move off through the trees, heading to Belvedere Castle. Standing atop one of the ramparts, Doctor Strange looks out at the quiet night. Sorry I'm late, a voice calls from above him. Yet there are no need for apologies, as Captain Marvel is right on time. The two look down as the menagerie of villains exit from the trees. It's a raccoon with a gun in a tree! Bullseye begins to laugh and cry at the sight of the Guardians. He stops as Groot leans in, growling about how Rocket always has a gun. Doctor Strange quickly quiets everyone, calling the meeting of the Infinity Watch together. This is the closest that all six stones have been in some time. Even now, powerful beings throughout the galaxy might be aware of this fact. So Doctor Strange is proposing that the stones need to be separated and protected, preferably off Earth. Pass, Turk scoffs. Adam Warlock steps forward. The Soul Stone has been different as of late. It has always hungered. Now it feels starved. Captain Marvel steps forward as well. She agrees that the Infinity Stones should be separated and that no one should know the location of more than one. Doctor Strange agrees, but also knows that with all six stones, this may be the best chance of defeating Thanos early. Combining the power of the Time Stone and the Reality Stone, they can look into what Thanos is doing and see his every movement. An image floats hazily up in the air, with gasps escaping from the crowd. Thanos lays dead, blood leaking from his headless body. Elsewhere in the cosmos, Loki sails in his guardian ship to the spot that Heimdall had marked on his map of stars. He seeks the answers to the questions that have vexed him for some time now. Who pulls the strings of destiny behind the scenes? What powers of fate direct him? Robed figures move forward, and as he steps out of his ship, calling out a greeting, the witches are awash with cackling energies. Infinity's end is here! They cackle, and they're suddenly gone. Loki calls out to the nothingness that he seeks answers. He searches for the quarry of creation. Another light washes the area and a heavy figure falls to the ground, clad in green robe, wielding a mighty hammer. This new Loki struggles to his feet, questioning where he is. His armor glows with the power of the Infinity Stones that ordain it. Ah, you must be my counterpart, Loki Odinson, the much stronger looking Loki calls. Yet this can't be right. Where are your Infinity Stones, your Molnir? Without these, you will not be able to breach into the original universe. The new Loki turns away. This universe is doomed to fall like all the others. Using his mighty hammer, Loki opens up a portal into another reality. But our Loki, from our world, tries to get some answers from him first. Yet is interrupted by a strange tentacle ripping through the portal. He turns to his scribe, questioning the horrible monster that they are viewing through realities. Can heroes triumph against such a beast? The screams of pain and spraying of blood seem to be their answer. Back on Earth, the meeting of the Infinity Watch continues as they argue about the future of the stones and where they should be kept safe. Turk refuses to give up his Mind Stone, turning on Star-Lord and accusing him of bringing a fake Power Stone to the meeting. The meeting subtly then turns into a brawl, with the villains and heroes regressing to their normal state of fighting each other, when suddenly Iron Man and Thor arrive trying to pacify the situation. Stark is then shot from the sky by a new being that joins the fray, a masked being, armed with a sword and the true power of the stone. Give me the stones and no one else need pay the price, they command. And to show their commitment, the newcomer tosses the head of Thanos to the crowd. Drax steps forward, demanding to know who this being is. Requiem is as good a name as any. These words punctuated as Requiem strikes out, slashing Drax with their sword. The destroyer is launched through a building high above them. Requiem quickly cuts through the rest of the Guardians, knocking aside Groot and shrugging off Quill's elemental blaster. Rocket empties his weapon into them, tearing the mask to pieces and revealing, Oh, hi Gamora! As the rest of them continue to fight, Peter steps forward, trying to reason with his friend. Gomorrah will use the Soul Stone to fix what is broken, but she orders Peter to step aside, and he stares at her. Or what? You're gonna kill me for the stones? But nothing ever stays dead, and Gomorrah shoves the Power Stone blade through his chest. You see, once, Thanos told her that the universe was molding the special soul that would be the bringer of his death. Gamora, clad in her Requiem armor, is that soul. Her blade slices through Thanos' head, separating it from his body. She pulls free her mask, staring down at her adopted father. This was the day that she killed him. Though his eyes were lifeless and his lips did not move, she still heard his voice in her mind. But back on Earth where we are now, Gamora stands before Peter, who refuses to move and her blade closes in on his chest. 
The world slows to almost a stop as Doctor Strange moves forward. Lucky for you, Quill, I wield the Time Stone. A sorcerer quickly moves Star-Lord out of the way of the passing blade, and the world returns to normal speed as Peter stares down in shock at his body not being pierced. Did Gamora just kill me? He stammers. Strange merely nods. In another universe, Peter Quill is dead forever. The battle continues to rage on around them, with Turk staring in horror as the massive weight of Groot begins to fall towards him. Yet once again, Doctor Strange is there, pulling him out of the portal. The two stand in a strange dimension where the otherworldly horrors are floating around them, with Doctor Strange offering Turk a view of the battle continuing in the park. Gamora cares nothing for the fortune that Turk has amassed with the Mind Stone. Should he hold on to the stone, Turk will be killed, and his fortune will be useless. If he gives up the stone now, he can keep his fortune and his life. The criminal ponders his choice for a moment before agreeing, under one condition, that Doctor Strange also owes him a favor. With a roll in his eyes, Strange agrees. And suddenly, Turk is standing in his home, one time stone less. Drax demands that Gamora drop the stone, yet another blow from her sword draws blood as an answer. Drax falls to his knee with the mighty Thanos standing behind him. Gamora stares at the apparition, ignoring his words to finish him off, and she swings her sword, yelling for Thanos to be quiet. Groot is confused. The Guardians stare in surprise as they watch Gamora argue with herself as, you know, Thanos is dead. Finally, the Avengers have arrived and stand against Gamora. Captain Marvel flies forward, rocketing Gamora off into space, commanding her to drop her sword in stone before she passes out. But back on Earth, Captain America commands the villains to leave and then watches the skies above them. The sword begins to fall back to Earth, so Captain Marvel floats back to Earth with the unconscious body of Gamora flung over her shoulder, tossing her to the ground. Magic energy twirls from Strange's fingers, restraining the warrior woman. You can have the sword, but we're taking Gamora back into space with us, Peter tells them as he steps forward. The rest disagree as there should be consequences for her actions. The tapping of Gamora's finger against the earth draws Captain America's notice as the realization of what happened dawns on him. He tries to call out a warning as Gamora uses the reality stone to drop her disguise as Captain Marvel. Gamora is not unconscious, that's Captain Marvel, and with the reality stone, Gamora has swapped places. A powerful blow rips through Doctor Strange and Captain America, and one by one, she defeats the Earth's mightiest heroes, claiming the stones for herself. Adam Warlock falls next, his head severed from his body. Black Widow leaps into aid, but the Time Stone stops her mid-kick. Finally, Gamora stands victorious, and she claims the last of the Infinity Stones. The apparition of Thanos looks on, smiling his approval. Take your prize. Nothing bad will happen. If it does, you can always undo it. The Soul Stone opens up before Gamora, and the elderly Gamora steps forward. The two embrace, and once again, they are a single individual. Her soul is now one, yet now the Soul Stone is imbalanced. Devandra must be fed. A voice reaches her ear. Stay your hand for a moment. That might not be necessary. Those are the words that Loki told her. But the stones power Gamora now, and the trickster god is quickly on his knees, begging for his life with her sword at his throat. Gamora already killed one god today. Why not another? Loki tries to tell her what he has seen in the other reality. She can sense that he has been to the god Quarry, but there is something beneath it. She uses the stones to peer into the next reality, and she sees herself fighting alongside Requiem, fighting against Moondragon and Phyla. She watches, but Gamora is not concerned about these other realities. Only this one. Loki's words about what lay beneath the god Quarry intrigue her, though. Yet she does not need a guide, and opens up the Soul Stone once again. The heroes of Earth will face judgment. The strong will not interfere when their souls are chained together. Reality begins to warp and twist around them as Gamora folds the universe in half. You see, what Gamora has done is taken the idea of what Thanos did, erasing half the life forms in the universe, but she, she did it in reverse. She took half the life forms and combined them with the other half. In this world, Professor Erskine has set out to create a super soldier. Unknown to the government though, the serum is not born of science. It is made of magic. Clad in robes, Private Steven Rogers steps forward. The Soldier Supreme, the merging of Captain America and Doctor Strange. Elsewhere, Thor has mixed with Tony Stark to create the Iron Hammer. X-23 has mixed with Scarlet Witch to create Weapon Hex. Moon Knight and Spider-Man have combined to make Arachnite. And Ghost Rider and Black Panther have created the Ghost Panther. The reality that Gamora wanted is a warped and twisted version of the history of our heroes and how they've now been combined and changed. Gamora looks on, 
wielded much cosmic power, have you? Loki snickers behind her. But she should keep in mind that much of creation was done by accident. Loki continues to spin his words, trying to convince the warrior to allow him to accompany her to the Quarry of Gods. He has so many questions, but she refuses. She wields the Infinity Stones now, and she's not dumb enough to trust Loki. She has infinite power. So she casts him into the Soul Gem, her reality, the world that she made. And with a hard thud, Loki lands on the streets of New York, with passerby seemingly ignoring the man who fell from the sky. He laughs as he stands up. He knows exactly what he must do. Gamora arrives at the God Quarry, now accompanied by Loki's Chronicler. Once the beings in the Soul Gem are destroyed, she will create a new reality. But first, she must learn the secrets of the God Quarry, and the place beneath it that cannot see. Energy erupts from the stones and digging through the barrier that blocks her sight. Eons of dead gods are torn from their slumber as Gamora begins her work. It was the last night of the World Science Festival at the American Museum for Natural History several years ago. Young Peter Parker had convinced his aunt and uncle to cut through the park on their way home. May didn't like the idea. You know how dangerous the park is at night, she told her husband. But Ben shrugged off the concern. He could keep them both safe. Peter began to run forward, a young child with no regard for the dangers that hide within our world. Then a creature leaped out of the trees, attacking the young boy. Years worth of psychiatrists would convince him that the green goblin-like creature didn't even exist, that it never happened. Peter tried to crawl away as the creature loomed over him when suddenly Ben was there, tackling the goblin from behind. The creature was too strong and the life of Ben Parker ends with a snap. May tried to protect her nephew, but she would be taken from this world to the edge of the monster's claws. Peter tried to struggle to his feet, but he couldn't. Instead of flopping onto his back, he just wanted to die. And that's when he heard it, the voice of the spider. Let me save you, child. Let me turn this around. It offered him. Awaken a totem, a spider. You are one of us now. The spider's bite, it saved him. Its venom connected him to an ancient bloodline, healing his wounds and giving him unbelievable powers. And in that moment, instead of an I, Peter Parker became a we. The police found the bodies and the child. Peter's story didn't make any sense. The boy didn't have a mark on him. His description of a goblin led them to think that his mind had snapped. The voices in his head didn't help. Two demanded action and one didn't know what else they could do. 15 years later, the hero known as Arachnite swings throughout the city, currently controlled by the friendly neighborhood Arachnid personality, fighting a living vampire on the streets of New York. Hey, blood banks don't work that way, Michael. You don't get to make a withdrawal. The web slinger quips as the fight continues on top of a speeding ambulance. Quick webbing pulls the creature from atop the ambulance, throwing him into a pile of garbage, when suddenly the personality known as the Knight takes over. The clenched fist of the group. You are a selfish, thieving monster who steals life giving blood from the sick. This personality is more intense, going in for the quick blows. Headlights illuminate the pair as the car behind them pulls up. Ease up, AK. I think you caught him. A masked Harry Russell tells him. The hooded hero agrees, but fear can be a powerful deterrent for the future. Leaving the vampires swinging from a lamppost, Harry and Peter speed away. Driving away, Harry turns to his friend. He needs the winning smile of the CEO now, not the crime fighter. A quick meeting nets them a $4 billion deal. And then Peter's off again, with the scientist taking the driver's wheel. Harry has to pull away the nerd from his experiments. He's needed on a plane pronto, but Peter just wants to run more tests. There's plenty of time. I have it till tomorrow morning, he complains. But it is tomorrow morning. On the way to the airport, it seems like Harry's having trouble with his father. It's a quick stop to Norman's house. They won't be late. It's a private jet. We can take off when we get there, Peter promises him. At Norman's residence, Peter acts friendly, jokingly making an offer on the house. But Harry just asks him to wait downstairs. His father isn't feeling well. The sounds of arguing and items being knocked over reach Peter downstairs when suddenly his spider sense kicks in again and he turns in time to see the goblin come crashing towards him. He dies out of the way as the voices begin to argue and scream within his head. Where did he come from? Here? Now? Kill it, kill it, kill it now! The suit folds around him, transforming him into the hooded hero. As he swings off in pursuit, Harry comes running out of the house, yelling for him to stop. The personalities begin to argue about who's going to fight the goblin. And cornering the beast in the park, flashbacks suddenly fill Peter's mind, and his personalities begin to switch. He stumbles forward, begging the voices to help him. You're messing this up. We're going to get hurt real bad, scientist Peter Parker yells for them. 
The creature attacks and the blow brings the knight forward. The knight now going for the killing blow when suddenly he's shocked from behind. Sorry, Pete. I can't let you do that, Harry tells him. Peter stumbles away questioning his friend and then Peter watches as Harry bends over the goblin, picking him up as he transforms back into Norman Osborn. Come on, Pop. Let's get you out of here, he says as he walks away. Peter quickly recovers, pulling back on his hood and returning to Norman's old home. His mind feels splintered now. Goblin by night is real, yet he knew that, but now he knows who it is. Peter finds the Seekers within the Russell home, a hidden chamber designed to hold the creature. The voices begin to argue again, screaming in his head. And exiting the home, they swing through the night air, with the knight wanting to execute him, but the others don't believe in it. This is the Goblin! The personalities switch rapidly, arguing over the best way to hunt the creature. Science Peter takes the wheel briefly, slamming into a wall, falling to the streets below. At Parker Industries, Harry is pushing his father through the darkened hallways. Norman believes that this is a bad idea, but Harry knows that Peter never comes down here. This is the place where he keeps all of his failed ideas and prototypes. Harry puts his father on a table, digging the arachnite throwing blade out of his chest. The pain pushes Norman too far and he transforms again, with the goblin snarling at Harry from the table. Dad, stop! You have to calm down, he yells as his father begins to trash the lab. But Norman is gone and he lashes out at his son, sinking his teeth into the man's neck. I was trying to fix it, Dad. Try to save you. Harry gargles from the floor. Memories of the night, everything changed, flash through Harry's mind as his life leaves his body. The noises from outside interrupt his video games and he called out to his father. But there was no answer. And curiosity caused him to seek out the source of the noise. The creature by the garbage cans isn't a cat or a dog though, and fear fills young Harry's eyes as he calls out to his dad again. The monster stumbles and falls, transforming before his eyes. Harry, help me, Norman gasps. Peter awakens on the hood of a car with MJ standing over him. Are you kidding me, Pete? You're supposed to be in Beijing, she yells at him. The clients are furious for you not showing up. And the two drive back towards the office. Peter promised that he would take care of everything. The voices begin to argue again in his mind that they don't have time, they need to hunt the goblin. The CEO wins out though. Peter spends a few minutes trying to smooth things over with their clients, and everything seems to be going well when... The goblin, here! The hero turns with the knight taking full control, brushing off the meeting in Beijing. The wall explodes inward with the goblin launching itself at Peter. That's it, Norman! I'm right here! Bring it on! The knight yells as the two are launched out the window, and as they fall through the sky, the knight rains blows on Goblin, his costume transforming as they fall. Peter tries to swing them to safety as the creature's fangs sink into his arm. Well, that's a staff infection waiting to happen. The friendly neighborhood arachnid quips as he takes control. Anger fills our hero as he stands over the Goblin, memories of his loved ones filling his head as he delivers blow after blow. And finally, he raises a blade to end it. Don't do it, Pete. Harry calls as he flies in on his old glider. Peter orders him to stay out of it, but he can't. That's my pops. Harry knows that his father hurt him, but it's a curse and he can't control it. Him not being a monster sometimes doesn't mean the monster gets to live. Norman didn't take Peter's family on purpose, but if Peter kills him now, it will be intentional. Arachnite pauses, shaken by Harry's words. He leans over his friend, apologizing for what happened. But Harry begins to shake and convulse, his skin changing and a howling laughter escapes his throat. Peter goes wide-eyed as his friend transforms, becoming a goblin himself, hopping on the glider and flying away. Norman stares after his son. What have I done? Peter picks up Norman, now strangely cured. Together they will find Harry and fix him, just as Harry would do for us. Mount Wondegore. The castle sits atop a hill, a swirling vortex overhead. For a millennia, unholy rituals have scarred and cursed this place, and also the thunder booms. Inside, a group circles the bloodstained floors where a young mutant woman is chained with arcane symbols. A demon from the darkest reaches of the pit peers inward at the offering of a vessel. Black tendrils lash outward, and the woman begins to scream. Yet despite the commands, the vessel does not hold, and the demon pierces through. Damn, I really thought that that would be the one, Herbert sighs. Two scientists begin to get to work, examining the corpse. The science is perfect, as are the spells they worked on. The vessel should have held. So Dr. Kinney makes a theory. What if the problem is that their creations are too perfect? Ficathon destroys perfection. Perhaps they need something flawed. So later, the vessel is placed in Sarah, imbued with the strongest spells and enchantments 
surgery is a success. The child grows within her and quickly she realizes that it will be a girl. It's a vessel, not a girl, Herbert tries to tell her. But Sarah won't listen, spending her time singing to the unborn child. Don't sing to the prenatal vessel, Herbert tries to convince her, yet it also doesn't help. Herbert is more interested in completing the rituals, making the child the strongest vessel that he can with his dark magics, preparing the warrior Hellhound as her teacher once she is born. Finally, the day arrives, and magical energy rips through the lab as the birth continues, until finally, little Laura is born. At two, they begin to test young Laura, and Sarah protests about them testing her daughter. She's a vessel, Herbert tells her, tossing the child into a pit with a cobra. Yet the girl is too fast for the snake, and her claws cut through it quickly. The tiny child gurgles and giggles as she tastes the blood of her enemy. At five, Laura comes running into the kitchen. Herbert smiles, showing Sarah the triggering spell that he created. The spell that shows Laura her target, sending her into a blind berserker rage. Nothing can stop her as her claws pop and she sinks them deep into the pig butler. A concerned Sarah leans over her daughter, asking if she's okay. And as the spell wears off, it leaves only a crying child to be hugged by her mother. We need to talk before you do these things. You don't just do these things to her, Sarah glares at Herbert. It, he insists. At 10, she is training in the art of combat with Hellhound. Dr. Kinney is already seeing the future, though, and pulls her young daughter away from the training. She needs to make a failsafe, for if Laura ever forgets who she really is, for that, she needs her blood. At 17, one year to go, Laura has become a capable warrior, using her magically enhanced claws to defeat Hellhound, blood oozing out of her wounds. I'm done for the day, unless you want to get up, she glares at her teacher. Herbert finally seems proud of Weapon Hex, barely noticing Sarah's absence and the fact that she seems so tired. Six months to go, Weapon Hex's first mission. Elsa Bladestone and her Atheist Crusaders are scaling Mount Wondagore, intent of ridding the world of the Demon Lord and his acolytes. Hellhound and Hex are sent to eliminate the threat, and the two descend from above, cutting through them quickly. But Elsa's attacks seem to have little effect on Hex as she uses her magics to heal and strike against her enemies. In the end, though, Bladestone escapes. Her father is laying dead in the snow. Later, Sarah visits her daughter in her chambers, but Laura seems distressed. Herbert has told her that her empathy is a weakness and she didn't feel good when she killed those people on the mountain. Herbert isn't always right, Sarah tells her. It's okay to care. Underneath the spells and the genetic meddling, you're only human. It's 48 hours until the day. Hellhound and Hex are sent on another mission to retrieve the artifact from the midnight guns that will help the ritual. The two crash through the window, attacking their enemies quickly. And as they cut through the group, blood is spraying across the walls. Hex stands over the fallen Hellfire. Yet, she hesitates. Hellhound's boot lands on the man's face, stomping out his life. I gotta do every damn thing around her, she curses. Back at the castle, Herbert is angry that Hex choked before the kill. It doesn't matter though, soon the ceremony will begin. Still angry. He orders Sarah to prep the vessel. Alone, Sarah explains to her daughter that they are leaving, that they have to run because she can't take the chance that the ceremony will kill her daughter. But something begins to happen. Mom, you have to run. Laura struggles as the blind rage from the triggering spell begins to overtake her. She attacks her claws, burying into her own mother's chest. And when it's over, she cries over her mother's body, apologizing. It's okay, honey. I love you. Take care of your sister. She tells her before dying. Elsewhere in the cavil, Babel the bovine, Nanny, readies to leave, along with her charge, Speed Weasel. Nothing can stop Laura as she cuts through the castle. She begins to threaten the cultists, and the panic screams from Weapon Hex being offline fill the corridors as she slashes her way through. I have a sister! Where is she? The door to Speed Weasel's room shatters inward, revealing Babel. The Nanny introduces Laura to her sister, Gavril. I told you, call me Speed Weasel, the little girl states, peering around her nanny's dress. Laura questions why she wants to be called Speed Weasel, but she receives the answer when Gavril zips around the room in a cackle of energy. The family gathering, though, is quickly interrupted as Herbert and Hellhound enter the room. Come here, little Speed Weasel, Herbert motions, but Laura jumps between him, ordering him to stay away. Yeah, stay away, Speed Weasel echoes. Herbert glares at his daughter. Laura believes that she is safe because she is the vessel. Gavril isn't her sister, she is her clone. The backup plan of Laura didn't work out. Your use is at an end. Dispatch your Hellhound. Hellhound runs forward at the two of them, locking blades against each other, with Laura yelling for Speed Weasel to run and destroy as much as she can. 
Bavel pleads to Herbert, trying to make him see the errors of his ways. But Hellhound quiets her as she drives her magic blade through her heart. Distracted, Laura leans over her former nanny, tears in her eyes. The brief moment is all Hellhound needs as she rears up behind her. In the main chamber, Speed Weasel crackles around the room at a magically enhanced speed, taunting Herbert's acolytes. Run, run, run! Break, break, break! I smashed your stuff! She crows, but she is suddenly snatched from her run by Hellhound, the wicked creature smiling at her. The acolytes cheer, offering to kill Speed Weasel. Herbert is suddenly among them, ordering Hellhound to chain her in the center of the room while he gains enough blood for the ritual. His axe is hacking through the acolytes, spraying their blood around. My sister's going to kick your butts, Speed Weasel screams, yet Hellhound smiles, because Laura's already dead. Back in the other room, Laura speaks a magical incantation, pulling her severed limbs back to her, struggling to get back to her feet. I'm coming, Gavril. In the ritual chamber, the demon lord has risen with black tendrils looming over Gavril, but Laura is there slicing through her chains. Herbert bellows at them, their souls belong to him. Someone will be the vessel today. Hex and Hellhound then clash again as the black tendrils encircle Hex, and she casts a final spell to cut down Hellhound, turning her into a blackened and charred skeleton. Anger courses through Herbert and he casts his own spell, bringing a storm of hellfire down on weapon Hex turning her body into a pile of ash. Heal from that, he says as he spits. Stunned, Speed Weasel slows briefly, just long enough for the black tendrils to entangle her. As the demon lord begins to overtake her body, the pile of ash begins to swirl and transform, and in a sparkle of magical energy, Weapon Hex is born again. She cradles Speed Weasel in her arms as the child transforms, a single tear falling from her eye. You're not a monster or a weapon. You're a human being like me, she tells her. Magical energy begins to flow over her, warping the room around her, and she glares at Herbert. I call upon the spirit of those who died for your madness to destroy you. As the spirits of the dead move against Herbert, Hex leaps at the creature that her sister has become, piercing its eyes with her magically charged claws. The demon's hold over Gavril is broken, and the body of her small sister falls back into her arms. The spirits of the dead cut through Herbert, leaving nothing but a chamber broken, destroyed, and covered in the blood of the damned. You're safe now, Gavril. Laura hugs her sister tight. We're both safe, and you can call me Speed Weasel. What comes next? The young Kinney asks. The two stand with Laura taking her sister's hand in hers. I don't know, but I know it doesn't happen here. And the two walk out of the castle into the world. The walls of the exclusive icy hotel glisten as the patrons begin to whisper. At the bar is that Sigurd Stark. Yet, why does the fifth richest man in Europe drink alone? They say that he seems cold and lonely as the very ice in which they are surrounded. Sigurd questions this himself, but the patrons aren't as quiet as they may think they are. Usually, Sigurd doesn't know himself why he's always so lonely. It took him five short years to build his company from nothing. His wealth allows him to surround himself with love and laughter whenever he chooses. Yet it means nothing to him. Success, fame, fortune, his technological genius, all meaningless. The only thing that would bring him true joy is knowing who he truly is. Anger of the unknown fills him and he smashes his icy glass in his hands. After mumbling a quick apology, Sigurd quickly excuses himself heading for the door. The barman calls out a warning though. A storm is blowing in and a man was lost two months back. Right now, a storm suits my mood, Stark grumbles, knowing that the lost man was his friend, Algren Vanko. The icy wind and snow blow down on him as the thunder rumbles overhead. Stark questions his sanity, stepping out into a world like this. Yet the fury of the wind and snow, the lightning, the storm, it feels like home. Against his better judgment, Sigurd moves off into the wind-swept grounds. It was five years ago that he came walking out of a snowstorm very much like this one, and there are no records of him, yet the world knows his face now. How does a man appear from nowhere? From within the whirling winds, a forest seems to appear before Stark. It is strange, he knows these lands like the back of his hand, but he could swear that there was no forest here. Perhaps a sander man would have turned back, yet something in Sigurd's mind urged him forward that day. The wind lessened as the twilight deepened within the wood, and stepping from behind a tree, he stopped short. My god! He gasped as his eyes widened in fear, because before him lay a wall of arrows drawn on the bows of pointed-eared dark elves. A voice echoed in his mind, speaking of the legends of the poisoned ones, the legions of Valtelheim. The arrow is unleashed, piercing his leg, bringing Sigurd down. 
and the elves cackle and laugh, stating that the poison will kill him within days. They turn as their commander orders them not to finish him. The one known as Crimson Curse knows this being. He is a man of science. He will be of use to us. Curse orders them to take Stark to the dwarf, where he will be useful or die. Through the woods he is carried, finally arriving at a lonely cavern beneath a tree stump. From within issues a friendly voice, that of Itri, the weapon smith. Stark thinks himself mad, seeing a dwarf from Legends, but Itri speaks to him, tells him that he is their captive, forced to make weapons for the Dark Legion, just as Stark is now. Yet despite the poison, Stark is not a man who's going to lay down and die, nor help evil. So the two devise a plan to arm Sigurd, to armor him against their arrows. If I must die, I'll feel better knowing that I spit in Meliketh's face. The name means nothing to Stark, simply a ghost from his past. The two begin to work along into the night with Sigurd detailing future technology to the ancient dwarf. The poison begins to consume his body, so Etri continues alone. His fever dreams are filled with the image of death's golden mask taunting him, and finally Etri awakens him. Task is complete. Your armor lives, he cries, as he holds out the pieces to Sigurd. But the poison has come for Stark. Quickly, the dwarf encases him in the armor, whose ruins will keep him alive and keep the poison at bay. In time, it will allow him to regain his strength. Yet they have no time, for the Crimson Curse has come for them both. Idri knows that he must buy his friend time, and he gives him the final piece of his craft, a hammer made of cold iron and the weakness of the elves. He must be worthy of its power. Truly become the Iron Hammer. And with these final words, Itri steps out into the cold. The mighty dwarf steps up to curse, delivering his final message to the Dark Master. He spits in their faces. Within the cavern, the energy cackles as Stark reaches for the hammer, his strength returning with every inch closer that he comes. Outside, the thunder rumbles as the lightning cracks against the ground. From beneath it, the mighty Iron Hammer emerges. You! Mortal man, the curse growls, yet Stark is now more than mortal. The power of the gods courses through him. A beam of lightning cuts forth, throwing the creature through the trees. From the darkness, the elves attack, and using his Heimdall onboard computer, Stark can see everything. The battle is joined, the elves falling quickly against his power. But the curse returns, and the two beings begin to lock into battle. Suddenly, Stark realizes that the curse was once his friend Algrim Vanko. If Meliketh's magics can turn this man into his thrall, then Stark must release him. Using the hammer's magic, Stark drives it through his old friend, releasing his spirit. The battle is won. Yet Stark is watched from the halls of Asgard itself. The evil Meliketh, master of the Ten Rings, Stain Odinson, the competitor who wants Sigurd dead, and the golden mask of Madame Hel. Stark knows nothing of these secret watchers, though, and he buries his friend in the woods of Norwegia. Swearing vengeance against Meliketh and his forces, such oaths are not to be taken so lightly. To reach the halls of Asgard, he will have to pierce the walls of reality itself. Perhaps if I use a bridging interdimensional frequency rotating outside space-time, Luckily, Heimdall hears his master signs mumbo jumbo and activates. The Bifrost opens before him, bringing surprise from Sigurd. Not caring if it's science or magic, Stark pulls on his helmet and prepares for battle. Leaping into the unknown, the power of the Bifrost whirls around him, flooding his mind with memories he once lost. His father, Howard Odin, chief and executive of Asgard, denies him the right to wear the armor as a warrior of Asgard. He is just as strong and brave as any of the Warrior Machines three. He is the son of Odin. The armor is his birthright. His adopted brother Stain steps forward, trying to calm his brother. But anger pulses through Stark and he lashes out. His words are careless and they bring anger from Odin himself. Your behavior, the arrogance and vanity that fills you like the poison of a snake, that is what makes you unworthy. Magic begins to pulse from Odin's ring, a sign of his power and the right as the ruler. Thus I cast you out, Stark Odinson. You are as guardian no more. Stark's memories are stripped of him, denying him until he proves himself worthy as he is cast to Earth. But that's just his origin. And now in the current day, Stark emerges from the Bifrost, fully aware of his past, standing in Asgard. Moving cautiously, Stark still doesn't notice the fact that the streets seem deserted. Danger lurks behind him as he turns to the sound of a villainous voice. Home at last, Stark Odinson. You must be hungry for punishment. Meliketh uses his powerful rings to attack him, the blast throwing Stark to his knees. More magic knocks the warrior back, crashing through a wall. 
He struggles to his feet, hearing Malekith's raspy laughter, like bones rattling in the dusty catacombs outside. Around him, though, are the imprisoned citizens of Asgard. Howard Odin calls out to his son, believing it to be Stain. I'm afraid not, Howard. This is your lesser son. Malekith laughs as he steps through the destroyed wall. Stark realizes that Malekith holds the power of the Ten Realms within his Ten Rings. How did you gain all ten, Malekith? The hero questions. But of course, Malekith gained them one by one, starting with the Midgard Ring, which was given to him by his ally. The sound of Odin's gasp reaches Stark as his brother enters the room. Stain should have been half-god as well, but now he will settle for watching the death of Stark Odinson. Stain, I'm sorry for the way that I've treated you. Stark tries to apologize, but his words fall on deaf ears, for Stain still hates him, even in exile. He was on holiday, growing rich off Asgardian technology. Finally, words are enough. Malekith turns on Stark, armed with the destructive power of the Odin force in his ring. I have delayed your execution long enough, Stark. He smiles, the beam cutting across the room, and at last, Heimdall, open the Bifrost, Stark orders, and the blast cuts through the portal, which opens on the other side of the room, shattering the prisons of the Warrior Machines 3. The three attack, crying for vengeance and Asgard, but they too are no match against Malekith's power with his magical rings. Smiling in triumph, Malekith turns back to his enemy just in time to take an iron hammer to the face. The dark elf's skin burns with the iron touch and he falls away. His rings are spent though, and his remaining magics are useless against Stark's mighty hammer. His last chance is the power of Midgard, the power of lightning. The hammer and the armor are charged to 1000%, bringing a warning from Heimdall. Yet it's okay. They won't be having the power for long. He plans on using them for the killer blow. Meliketh begs for his life as Stark stands over him, offering nothing. Algrim Vanko and Etri the Dwarf return them to life. Stark offers as he raises the hammer. The killing blow falls and the wizard with it. Stain curses his brother, vowing that the fight isn't over as he flees. Odin is proud of his son. Yet Stark doesn't listen and exits the building, following after Madame Hell herself. Madame Hell, a moment? He asks. Hell turns to the champion, asking if he plans to mock her defeat. Nay, only a fool would mock the power of death. I offer only my respect as he kneels before her. Once he was a man who was trapped in his own immortality, and it consumed and spoiled him. Now he has tasted the kiss of death. Now he continues forward, not as a god, but as the man, Sigurd Stark, the Iron Hammer. The technologically advanced city of Wakanda has always been free. While there, the arrogant young prince trains with his father in combat, but he questions his father's rules and traditions until he is exiled for his insolence and must walk the world. He walks through the world until he comes to America. There, in a crime-ridden city, he finds a few injustices and steps in to help those in need. In doing so, he also finds a new father. Jericho Simpson, but some people call me Brother Crash. The old man introduces himself. Brother Crash owned his own stunt show and brought the young prince in, questioning whether he is scared easily. I am utterly without fear, was the young prince's response. But he would need a new name, a stage name to fit his new persona. Five years later, T'Challa walks out amongst the thousands of screaming fans with the announcer calling his name to all of those who came to see him. Let's put your hands together for... Johnny Blaze! He takes his bike, revving up the engine, getting a cheer from the crowd, and he flies forward, riding fast on the ramp, leaping through the air as the line of buses pass beneath him. Suddenly, his world flashes dark as he sees his father standing before him, softly calling his name. The bike tumbles beneath him as the crowd gasps when he falls. He's standing in the back now, still clad in his biker's garb. Do not be afraid, son of Wakanda. The voice calls from the darkness. He turns and a woman stands before him in a traditional dress, her panther skull ablaze, lighting the darkness around them with a torturous flame. I am the forsaken half-sister of your sacred bast, the hunter of souls, the panther queen of vengeance, Zarathos, the demon explains to him. What do you want of me, dread lady? T'Challa questions, and Zarathos wants only to repay a debt. Jericho Simpson has evoked a favor to save his own life. Your broken body is healed. Your drifting soul returned to your body, she tells him. Yet she pauses, turning back to him. She smells a hunter's soul in him. She can return his life out of obligation, but she can also grant him power. Power greater than any Black Panther. 
T'Challa questions the cause. Zozarathos' eyes blaze when she answers. Souls, the souls of the guilty and the wicked. I shall make you such a hunter that never have stalked the world before. T'Challa ponders that for a moment, and while he offers her respect, he declines. The price is too high. Zarathos turns away, walking once again into the dark. So be it. Condolences on your loss, young prince. T'Challa snaps back to the world of the living, sitting up with a gasp in a demonic circle of candles to find Brother Crash in front of him. He stands, struggling away, forcing Crash to help him, telling him to slow down. Hold on, boy. You were dead a few minutes ago. But T'Challa can't wait. His father is dead and he must return to Wakanda. Brother Crash grows sad. He knew this day would come. Yet T'Challa reaches out to the man who has become more of a father to him over the last few years. His sister will be crowned queen. He will pay his respects and he will return. This is my home, he tells him, and the two share a fatherly hug. In Wakanda, T'Challa questions his sister about his father's death, and they watch the hologram play out. They call themselves the Freemen. The gorilla has two synthetic arms, and he watches as his father blocks a punch from the cyborg. But the smaller one, known as Raven, slips in behind the king, slashing him with his blades. He is quick and can seem to predict the lost king's attacks. But the Black Panther is fast and strong, and his attacks seem to be winning. Suddenly, there is an explosion from behind him, and the king is distracted. T'Challa turns from the hologram in rage. Enough, Shuriri! I will not watch my father die! He cries, demanding to see the heads of the killers. Yet his sister explains that they have not been found. What? They live? How? You're the Black Panther now. How have you not brought them in? But Shuri Ri explains that she is not the Black Panther. There is no heart-shaped herb. The deep gardens were destroyed in the attack. What is it you think they blew up? She explains, motioning once again to the hologram. T'Challa is stunned. Without the herb, there can be no Black Panther. No King of Wakanda. His sister explains that the government is in chaos. She is trying to hold the tribes together as best as she can. Will I have your support, brother? The Dark Queen is suddenly over his shoulder again. Poor Prince. Perhaps a gift? Shall I allow you to smell out your father's killers? She whispers. She asks for nothing in return. It is merely a gift. T'Challa comes back to reality with his sister's hand on his shoulder. Ignoring her words, he tells her that he needs a motorcycle. My name is Johnny Blaze. Call me T'Challa once I return with the heads of our father's killers. He explains and he walks out. He can smell their blood as he rides across the African plains, dust kicking up behind the trail of his motorcycle. Zarathos calls to him. He was born to hunt. From their cave, the gorilla watches the rider approaching, calling out to his comrade. Umbakshula will deal with his lone warrior from Wakanda. T'Challa dismounts, pulling free his traditional energy spear, and he finds the gorilla standing before him, his size blocking the sun. He dodges the fist as it impacts the ground. This is the great killer of the arena, Bane of the Masters, Slayer of the Martians, Umbakshula the White. The gorilla attacks again, dodging T'Challa's energy blast quickly, blows raining down from above, destroying the boulders around them. Umbakshula has killed 12 Martians since he was eight, he explains, gripping T'Challa's spear, attempting to rip it from his grasp. The prince presses the button on the hilt, jumping away, and the explosion tosses him further. He turns back, seeing the gorilla standing before him. You are going to have to do better than that. He struggles, but the hand grasps T'Challa by the neck, lifting him into the air. Zarathos, your offer! The prince gasps. He can hear her words whispering in his head, and he agrees. And that is when his head is suddenly ablaze. The panther skull staring at Mbakshula as he drops him in surprise. I smell your guilt, prey! The ghost panther snarls, reaching for the man pulling him close. The hunt is over. Your soul is forfeit! The panther's jaws open and Mbakshula's soul is ripped from his body. The Ghost Panther laughs as the flames engulf him. Yet suddenly T'Challa is once again there, refusing to eat the souls of the men before him. Suddenly the argument is cut short as he is run through by a spear. The Raven is suddenly in front of him. When you get to hell, tell them Eric Killraven sent you. He spits as the prince falls. Wakanda has always been free. In the future, the Martians come. Wakanda fights them off. Wakanda has always been free. It is from this place that a young woman and her child were exiled. They were taken by the Martian people. The young mother would tell her son stories about Wakanda and the Black Panther. To kindle his heart the flames of liberty, the young Eric was taken by the Martians and placed in the arena. Through the training, through the experiments, through the fighting, the killing, through these things, something else burned in the heart of Eric Kilraven. 
hatred for Wakanda. Through the Martian experiments, Eric was given extrasensory powers, and eventually, he discovered the Time Diamonds. T'Challa turns away from the demon Zarathos. Is that how I'm supposed to spend my death? You telling me fairy tales? But they are not fairy tales, they are stories of his enemy's life. Yet the prince does not care. He will not be her hunter. He will not be the Ghost Panther. Eating souls is too high of a price. Zarathos laughs. Vengeance is merely the dessert. A man can only survive a dessert for so long. But duty, protecting one's kingdom, one's people, one's family. T'Challa turns at the demon's words, understanding dawning on him. Shuri Ri. Zarathos nods. Kill Raven has launched himself through time to have vengeance against Wakanda. He has killed the king and the prince. What do you think will be next? Anger fills T'Challa. Yet Zarathos does not threaten, she does not lie. Hunt for me. Be the Ghost Panther. You were born for it. The agreement is torn from his lips, and once again T'Challa is sent to the world of the living. From the darkness, another voice can be heard, offering to take the prince's place. Once again, I answer no, old man. I want the boy. She smiles. T'Challa struggles to his feet, scaring the vultures away. Alive once again, and his head ignites the panther's skull ablaze. Once more he hunts. Straddling his bike, he rides for Wakanda, his demonic laughter filling the plains. Shuri Ri stands before her people. They are at a crossroads. The herb is no more. There is no Black Panther yet with her new panther heart armor. Wakanda will continue. Suddenly a voice calls out, Hold, princess! Eric Killraven calls, leaving the bodies of the guards behind him. But the roof suddenly shatters as the flaming rider descends, his cackling filling the room. I smell my father's blood on your hands! He snarls, shrugging off Killraven's bullets and attacking. Shuri Ri is stunned. Could this be her brother? The two begin to trade blows with Kill Raven being one step ahead of the prince. T'Challa tries to attack, but his blows are easily dodged. He snaps the man's sword, but that's when he's shot through the gut as Kill Raven empties his pistol into him. In the darkness, Zarathos watches her hunter, the voice behind her explaining that Kill Raven has had many years of killing. T'Challa doesn't stand a chance. What do you suggest, you old fool? She questions. The boy will need a guide. A mentor. Kill Raven flips away, throwing darts at T'Challa, and there is a brief pause before they explode, engulfing him further in flames. They only slow his movement, though, attacking once again. Kill Raven presses a button, activating his bombs. Zarathos watches, and the voice explains that Wakanda needs Bast, the Panther Mother. Shuri looks up, the bombs will burn them all. She begins to use her kimonio beads to try and disarm them. Her brother and Killraven continue the battle behind her as she is attempting to save Wakanda itself. The man steps out from the darkness before Zarathos. I pledge my soul to your service. Allow me to help T'Challa. The demon's flames burn brighter. You have convinced me, old man. I accept your service, T'Chaka, last Black Panther of Wakanda. In the world of the living, Shuri Ri begins to deactivate the bombs as T'Challa finally gets a grasp on Kill Raven, his blade slashing down, severing the blazing arm. Suddenly, the room itself is ablaze as the flaming panther steps through into the world of the living. T'Chaka's voice reaching out, calling to his children, much to their surprise. The black panther stands before his son. They have both made a terrible choice for their people, but now they hunt for Wakanda. T'Challa and T'Chaka ride forward, lunging at Killraven, who can no longer see his future. Standing over his body, Killraven just snarls at them. They only prove him right, that the rulers of Wakanda are monsters. And the two of them reach down. We are three monsters. The monsters that we've had to become for our people. He tells him as he leans in, devouring his soul. So from this day forward, the kingdom of Wakanda is ruled by the damned King T'Challa, the Ghost Panther, attended by his father, the Revenant T'Chaka, and the brilliant Shariri, the Panther Heart. These three would ensure that there will always be a place known as Wakanda, which will always be free. The world was at war. The world was burning. Young Stephen Rogers had volunteered for a special program to be a lab rat for some scientist experiment to make a super soldier for the United States. Strapped into the test chamber, Stephen waited. An army officer stands outside Dr. Erskine's office, letting her know that the candidate is ready. 
Within her chambers, Dr. Erskine floats above a satanic symbol. Bowls of sacrificed entrails surrounding her as the candles float weightless. I must have a few more moments to complete a sensitive experiment. For science, she calls. Finally, the doctor stands before Stephen, a needle in hand, as she asks him if he is ready. She leans in, yet the needle does not pierce his skin, and her fingers glow with dark magic. Her lips mutter a strange incantation, and she finally steps back. And on the table, young Stephen suddenly slumps and falls, bringing nothing but disappointing looks from the army officers in the room. That's when Roger suddenly comes back to life, ripping free of his bonds. Mein Gott! An MP cries, dropping his disguise in surprise. The German spy opens fire, but his bullets bounce harmlessly off of Stephen Rogers' magical shield. The spy turns his weapon on to Dr. Erskine. Magical energy fills Stephen as he leaps across the room. With a punch fueled by dark magic, the spy bursts into flames upon impact. Oh gosh, what did she do to me? Stephen questions, staring down at his glowing hands. With Dr. Erskine dead, the U.S. Army has only one super soldier, so they begin testing his abilities immediately. His magical shield can withstand the impact of a bullet, a rocket, and even a tank shell. The world is different now. Captain Steven Rogers became known as Soldier Supreme, fighting the war against the Nazis alongside Dum Dum Fury and Bucky Wong. The Howling Commandos of Hogarth. On the battlefield, the commandos use their combination of magic and modern technology to turn the tide of war against the Nazi machine. After several months of fighting, the men found themselves in the frozen hell of the Ardennes forest. This is the worst assignment ever, Wong notes as Stephen pulls his cloak tighter against the cold. If we don't do this, someone else will have to, Buck, he responds. Yet their conversation is cut short as an artillery round drops into their foxhole. A stunned soldier supreme regains consciousness, staring at the carnage around him. Rogers! Follow me, soldier! He's gone! Dum Dum yells, reaching for the wizard. But Steven refuses, his eyes glowing with arcane power as he pushes Fury away. I have work to do, he states as he begins to mutter a strange spell. Later, on a combat patrol, Dum Dum pulls the young man aside. The men need to see him leading, not just using his magic to defeat the enemy. To fix our bodies when we break, he notes, lifting his hat, showing the bullet wound that had pierced his skull and went out the other side. The conversation is cut short as a young private runs up, his face crossed with a large smile. Rogers, I have incredible news! Hitler's dead, the young man tells the squad. Ha! And you thought we'd be fighting till April! Fury laughs. Yet even with the death of Hitler, the Allied forces still had to deal with Dormammu Red, Hitler's priest of hell. The evil being of magic, his red skull blazing with arcane fire, standing tall in the forest of the Ardents. The land will be purged of impurity. Walls will be built around the savage lands, he promised. Yet the Soldier Supreme's magical shield leaps out of the darkness, colliding with the magical being. Go back to hell. If you stay here, I'll make you suffer. He promises with another leap at his enemy, preparing to make another magical attack. But Dormammu's hand wraps around his throat and he brings his fist against Steven's face. He laughs, promising to march the soldier's undead body across the United States when his army invades its shores. Dormammu stands over Steven, hammering him with both magical and physical attacks. I'm gonna flay and keep you alive. I'll hang you writhing from my standard as I take New York, he grins. Finally, the evil being prepares to make the killing blow, but Stephen Rogers' eyes begin to glow. Any time now, he struggles. Dormammu Red's eyes go white as a ghostly bayonet is shoved through his chest. He turns, staring at the sight of the ghostly Bucky Wong standing behind him. With this distraction, Roger struggles to his feet, knocking the villain across the forest with a magically charged punch. But Dormammu isn't done yet, and he begins to cast a spell. Dark tendrils wrap around the pair, pulling them away from the realm of light. The Soldier Supreme tries to cast his magical shield, yet it doesn't seem to work. Goodbye, Herr Rogers. There's no escape for you from this place. Embrace the darkness within and without, are the last words that Steven hears. And a magical flame leaps to life in his hand, with Steven staring at the ghostly image of the Winter Soldier. It's good to see you, pal, he tells him and Bucky suddenly begins to disintegrate as his image blows away. Now alone, Stephen Strange stares into the darkness. Decades pass as Stephen is locked away in the dark dimension. Once again, the demons and the monsters of the realm begin to assault him, and using his magic, he calls forth his shield, using it to bounce from enemy to enemy around the vast chamber. He has spent years becoming a powerful magical warrior, yet he grows lonely. He walks calmly away into the vast darkness, his enemies vanquished. Then, in the distance, 
he sees the light. The brightest light that he has ever seen in this dimension. Quickly he begins to run forward, yet he is not the only one, and quickly the other citizens of this dark realm begin to run forward as well. Back, foul creatures! He cries as he leaps away from their grasps, right onto the back of a galloping centaur. Ride or die, he commands, creating a magical bridle to steer the warrior. This indignity is beyond any that I've suffered, the proud centaur snorts. I'm not crazy about it either. The two ride forward, attacking the monsters around them as they go, hoping to slow their enemies, and at the last moment, Stephen Strange leaps forward, reaching for the light, just as the monsters behind him reach for his cloak and boots. On Earth, the robed figures stand at the center of a large Stonehenge, praying over the altar of satanic symbols. The world is under attack. The powerful force of nature is consuming mortal souls, the leader states, lifting his knife high into the air. The blade plunges downwards, sacrificing the creature and allowing its blood to pour into the goblet. The savior must be delivered or we will be destroyed. A bright light flashes over their heads and the Dark Lord appears. Mordok, the mental organism ritually designed for the occult. Thank you, Tim, the large-headed being states. We are all here to save the world. I will save it by delivering a powerful being from the dark dimension, Mordok explains, and suddenly a portal opens over the altar and the being arrives. Hail Satan! The worshippers cry. Oh, uh, hello, Stephen answers them sheepishly. The crowd gasps and a young woman in front smiles. Wow, Satan is more handsome than I would have guessed, she smiles, and her friends look at her in disgust. What? Satan would want me to have these lustful feelings, Ryan. But Mordok knows that this isn't really Satan, and he attacks Soldier Supreme. Rogers is thrown across the room, stunned, as Mordok casts Crimson Bands to hold him. But Steven has learned a few tricks in his decades in the Dark Dimension. Like how to spirit walk, he cries as his spirit leaves his trapped body. His spirit form attacks Mordok, and he realizes that he is actually two souls trapped together. Suddenly, Mordok falls to the ground, losing focus on his spell and Steven returns to his body, just as one cultist is about to bring down a large sword on his head. But he uses his magic shield to block it and cast Fist at the guy's jaw, knocking him out with one blow. Take off your robes and never wear them again, Steven yells. And stop trying to summon Satan, or I'll be really angry. It's been decades since he was cast into the dark dimension, and now Rogers must face something truly horrible. Endless debris. He seems to sit forever in meetings until finally he merely stands up and leaves. I have work to do. He returns to his home in Brooklyn, and there he is surrounded by strange magical artifacts. And he finally stares into the eye of Agimodin that he took from Mordok. Within himself, he sees two souls, that of the perfect soldier, Captain America, and the Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange, and his universe was created by some cosmic collision. The Infinity Warp's universe does not belong. Suddenly, in his mind, he hears a voice speaking to him telepathically. We need more heroes. If you can hear my voice, then I need you to answer the call. Emma Frost tells him. Magic swirls around him, and regardless of being two souls trapped, he knows what he must do. This is Steven Rogers. I hear you. And now, Loki is trapped within the Soul Gem, and he's arrived at the Xavier Mansion. He is met by a strange creature, exposed to the world. Quickly moving past the horrid creature, he finds himself met at the door by a recognizable yet unfamiliar being. Well now, this is unexpected. You're Logan and Emma Frost merged together, aren't you? The tangle of souls pops its claws, stabbing Loki in the shoulder. Pain rips through the god, yet now his intentions are seen. Inside of the building, Logan Emma sits with Loki, drinking and catching up on the plot. Loki's plan requires a telepath, so Logan Emma leans back taking a long drink from their wine glass. If she took the whole universe and installed it into the Soul Gem, then the Infinity Stones must exist within the Soul Gem with us. Exactly, Loki says. Now you just have to go put on the telepathy helmet thing and we can figure it all out. But they're interrupted as a giant soul spider thing appears behind them. Logan Emma stabs the creature, realizing that its name is Devandra and it hungers for souls. Quickly, the two work together and they dispatch the beast. So Logan Emma begins to pour themselves more wine. Once they stabbed a watcher and knew that in the future they would meld with the Phoenix Force, it would be easy to send a telepathic message to themselves to arrive at this exact moment. And that's the plan, because suddenly the room fills with a blinding light and the Phoenix Force floats before them. Loki smiles at the real power before him. Combined, Gamora will be no issue. But Phoenix Logan isn't staying. 
He tosses the power stone to Loki. Here's a rock. And he turns to go. Loki calls out asking that he separate Logan and Emma. And with a crackle of energy, the two souls are untangled. And in front of Loki is Logan and Emma Frost. I I'm at a loss for words, she stammers. And with a quick pop, the Phoenix Force is gone. If you want to know more about the Phoenix Force within a version of Logan, we'll tell you that story another day. There is more to that story. Tossing aside his glass of champagne, Logan goes to get himself a proper drink. The Power Stone glows on the floor, and Emma's boot stops Loki from retrieving it. I trust you as far as I can throw you, Loki. She reads his mind, and she knows that he intends to recruit Kang the Conqueror next. Logan agrees from the fridge, wanting to grab a beer before they hit the road. Suddenly, Devandra appears. Claws pop, and the two are locked in combat. Loki and Emma leave Wolverine to his work. Stepping outside, they find a biker waiting for them. Emma has called them a ride with her telepathy, and the two thunder off in search of Kang the Conqueror. Now, in the other universe, the main universe, Mjolnir wielding Loki kneels before Requiem. I'll see you in hell! As she brings the mighty hammer down on his head, the villain turns to her other captives, Moondragon and Phyla. Phyla is shocked as Moondragon agrees to cut a deal. The stone for their lives. So Requiem moves forward, extending her hand. No tricks, she hisses, as she begins to read her mind. But now Moondragon has her locked in mental combat. Gamora, aka Requiem, and Moondragon stare, frozen. Phyla breaks free, drawing her powerful sword, yet she hesitates. Moondragon can't be locked in her mind when she dies. It is too late, though. Requiem has read Moondragon's mind and knows where the last stone is located. So the two manage to break free, using their power to throw themselves through dimensions. And suddenly they break through the rainbow walls of the dimensions. Overhead, the rainbow cuts across the sky as rain and lightning fall in the distance. We are now back inside of the world, created within the Soul Gem. Kamala Kang stands in front of Loki and Emma Frost, confusion on her face as they explain that she is supposed to be Kamala Khan and Kang the Conqueror. Luckily now, Emma and Loki have the power to separate the beings, and they split them apart, having Kang and Kamala join the team. Once again they teleport, arriving to stand above the tiniest, angriest version of the Hulk ever. Little monster, no join! The Hulk yells at them. Loki giggles at the sight, but is surprised when the little monster leaps forward, punching him in the face. Emma uses her powers once again, splitting Scott Lang, Ant-Man, from the Hulk. Now Ant-Man and the Hulk have joined this strange team of heroes. Once again, the team teleports, arriving in the barren wastelands that truly represent the Soul Gem. Before them, Adam Warlock stands in combat with Devandra, its tentacles wrapped around him. Hulk and Miss Marvel leap into battle, trying to slow Devandra down, but it is too late, and the creature swallows Warlock. Emma orders Scott Lang to get into the mix. Do we really need this guy? Isn't he famous for being dead? Shrinking down, Scott launches himself at Devandra, leaping into its mouth. Moments pass until he grows in size again, ripping his way out of the beast. Adam Warlock in his hands. Horrible, just horrible! Scott struggles as he returns to his normal size, his body moist with juices from the creature's stomach. But the beast isn't dead. And the heroes look on as Devandra begins to pull itself back together. The world needs heroes now. Warriors to defeat the Devandra creature. Emma sends out the call to the strange, twisted heroes of the world. Soldier Supreme hears the call. The Arachnite. Hex 23. And at a jazz club, Arthur Douglas hears the call. At the quarry of the gods, Gamora has hit a barrier. Swinging her sword, the power stone has no effect. This shouldn't be happening. This can't be the edge of the universe, she growls. Yet the image of Thanos in her mind, the visage that she has created since killing him off, whispers into her ear. Whatever happens next should truly be amazing. He motions upwards for her, and floating above them are the Watchers. They ring the barrier, observing Infinity's end. What are you looking at? She yells at them. She ignores her new observers, trying to continue to push through the barrier into the quarry of creation. Back inside of the Soul Gem universe, the tangled creation of heroes are locked in combat with Devandra. Adam Warlock stands by their side, helping fight against the Soul Gem, although some of the heroes do not consent to being ripped apart. Elsewhere, Loki and his band of strange Avengers push through the wastelands that are the Soul Gem, and finally they arrive at a simple hut that has been placed in a tree. Emma and Miss Marvel push past Loki, moving upwards into the home, and inside, they find a young Gamora, who sits and plays with her stones. The three women return to the group. They have nothing to fear from this Gamora. Our new friend is going to let us borrow her fun rocks. 
Emma informs them. So Loki takes hold of the stones. He knows that this world is different and so too are these infinity stones. Emma Frost will wield the Power Stone. The Hulk will utilize the Space Stone. The Time Stone will be given to Ant-Man. The Reality Stone to Kang the Conqueror. And the Soul Stone to Loki himself. The Mind Stone to Miss Marvel. Kamala steps forward. What if he's wrong? Then we'll all die and take two universes with us. He tells them simply as he opens up the portal. And they all step through to the final battle. At the Quarry of Creation, Phyla and Moondragon suddenly arrive, ripping through the wall of dimensions and landing with a thud at the barrier. Gamora stands before them. You don't belong here. The heroes rush into battle, attacking Gamora quickly, still armed with the stones, though. They're no match for her power. There is no one left that can kill me, she informs them, but Emma's voice calls out from behind her. Why not try us? She doesn't know how they escaped and it doesn't matter. Gamora leaps into battle with all of these weird heroes, her blade colliding with the diamond skin of Emma Frost, shattering on contact. Gamora stands before her locked in anger, demanding to know, what is this? Kamala moves in from the side, grabbing her power stone. And next, the Hulk moves in, throwing her into the earth time and time again. Gamora struggles to her feet, trying to stop the heroes. But that's when she fights Kang, now multiplied into dozens of Kangs throughout time. Also, Ant-Man is there. Gamora begins to lose the stones almost as easily as she acquired them. So Loki moves amongst the team, congratulating them on the great job that they've done. They've defeated Requiem. They have taken back the stones. Phyla and Moondragon move in to finish the job, but Loki is there and sends them along with Gamora through a portal. He stands before his team, now armed with all of the Infinity Stones that he stole from them. He begins to fall backwards into the barrier, a smile on his face. Thank you for your help, and if I don't return, it's because I found something better. Darkness of the Void surrounds Loki. The stones fall to his feet, still glowing, but now they are powerless. Placing them into his pocket, he begins to move forward. He looks above, and in the darkness above him float the Celestials, the ancient beings of cosmic power that float through the darkness as the vast number of stones sparkle around them. Back in the Soul Gem universe, the heroes continue to fight a losing battle, when suddenly a portal opens up and Gamora, Moondragon, and Phyla lay before them. The heroes do not hesitate, leaping into attack the being once known as Requiem. On a backcountry road, Arthur Douglas drives his car at breakneck speeds, knowing that he needs to go somewhere to do something, when the strange spider creature suddenly appears on the road and the car passes right through it, and he plows into a tree. Arthur and his wife struggle from the wreckage, and he sits by the tree, wishing he knew what to do. I am Pete, the tree tells him, a face smiling. His wife jumps in alarm, yet Arthur knows that it's okay. Um, I'm friends with this tree, I think. The tree suddenly becomes a being on two legs, picking up Arthur and flying away. Loki, in this dark void, which is between all of the universes, screams up to the Celestials above him. Is this all there is? Are you the gods above us? Are these the beings that plot and scheme and pull the strings of fate? The being reaches forward, its massive hand pointing. Loki turns and is shown a black mirror. He leans in. If these beings have written his destiny, then it is within their power to show him his future. He stares at the mirror, laughter suddenly erupting from his lips. So that's the way it goes. He turns back to the cosmic beings, wishing them a fond farewell, and he steps through the portal knowing when he's beat. Back at the quarry of the gods, the stones that Loki left behind have faded and turned to ash. The heroes turn as another portal opens and the trickster re-emerges. He offers them the stones back as he has no more use for them. There are no tricks this time. Loki then turns back to the Asgardian ship that is waiting for him. Flawa, his chronicler, has been waiting for him aboard. And the two float away to Omnipotent City. But back inside of the Soul Gem universe, the battle continues. The Soldier Supreme facing off against Requiem. But now that Gamora's stones are useless, they're falling inert to the ground. Rogers uses his strength and magic to rain blows upon Gamora, knocking her into the waiting jaws of Devandra. She is then saved by Arthur at a flying tree. Adam Warlock doesn't understand how do the stones no longer work. Luckily, Emma and her team return armed with working Infinity Stones. The only way to stop this now is to separate the entwined souls, restoring the normal universe and escaping the Soul Gem universe that has been created. Steven Rogers steps forward as he won't allow them to destroy his world. Yes, they are created from two individuals being merged together, but in this universe, Individuals such as the Soldier Supreme and Steven Rogers himself have their entire lives behind them. Entire histories created. This is a universe unto itself now. They shouldn't just wipe one out to save another. So Adam Warlock comes up with a plan. He believes that he can copy the warped reality, but then Devondra will continue to be a constant threat to them. 
Except the Hulk isn't done yet, leaping forward and using the Space Stone to actually create a black hole. Devondra screams in rage as it's sucked within itself. And Scott Lang stares on in wonder. Sorry, it's just the strongest there is. Hulk smiles. Now armed with the Soul Gem, Adam Warlock begins to unfuse the varied heroes. Groot and Star-Lord are separated, as is Drac the Destroyer in his original identity, Arthur Douglas. The team now begins to create a new reality, a blank slate for the heroes of the warped reality to live in. Emma uses her powers to erase everyone's memories of the Soul Gem universe and the things that transpired within. With this task complete, Adam Warlock begins to copy everything back into the normal universe. But they must move quickly. The Hulk's black hole is beginning to break down the Soul Gem. But there isn't enough time, and Warlock can only form one portal. Arthur Douglas and Drax move on to the other side, using their strength to actually pull the portal into two. And now that there are two portals, Adam Warlock is able to save both the Warp universe and their own. The world of the Soul Gem begins to die around them, and someone must hold those portals open so that everyone can escape. Drax and Arthur close their eyes. They know their fate. They're going home. For the final thank you to his friends, Warlock uses the Soul Gem to protect the rest of the group, and they fly through the portal. The Soul Gem protects them as they bore through the dimensional barriers and paradoxes. And with a mighty explosion, the heroes arrive back on Earth. Devondra's universe obliterated behind them. Gamora is the first to awaken, staring at the Infinity Stones before hanging her head in shame. Violet and Moondragon awake, leaping forward to attack the being who destroyed their world. Star-Lord leaps to protect his friend, but this Gamora didn't destroy anything. They saved the world from complete destruction. The heroes once again begin to argue over the stones, and finally Adam Warlock picks up the Time Stone, freezing the heroes around him. He uses the stone's powers using it to rewrite this familiar tale. At first, Warlock doesn't know what to do. Everyone who has wielded the Infinity Stones has been undone by their own choices and decisions. Perhaps I shouldn't decide. Maybe they should. Time continues and the heroes are suddenly watching Warlock holding the stones, and Gamora is no longer with them. You see, Adam Warlock used the stones to send her to the place where she would do the most good. The stones have now each been given a soul of their own. They are sentient and they will write their own destinies. And with a crackle of energy, the stones all fly away, vanishing into the universe. With the stones gone, the battle has ended. Phyla and Moondragon fly away to find their place in this universe. And Scott Lang wants to know if anyone wants to share an Uber with him. But fear not, my dear listeners. The heroes of the Warp Universe continue to exist, forming a team to defend their world. And in a quiet suburban neighborhood, Arthur Douglas lives his life with his wife. And on a barren world somewhere in the galaxy, Gamora kicks open a strange cocoon on the ground. Who are you? The young man asks, shielding his eyes from the glare of the sun. His name is Magnus, and he asks her how she got here. She tells him, a friend sent me. And there you have it, the full story of Infinity Wars. Gamora became Requiem, killing Thanos, and then creating a new universe. Now, this storyline picks up in Guardians of the Galaxy that we just started covering on Sundays right here at the Comic Story and Channel. You can actually go to the video right before this one and see the first part of that. Honestly, I'm a little sad that Requiem turned out to be Gamora. I thought it'd be some new character or a new history or new lore. They looked awesome, they acted awesome, and then it just turned out to be a character we already know. Either way, I did enjoy Infinity Wars and Infinity Warps, and I hope you did as well. And I guess I'll see you guys next time right here at the Comic Story and Channel, where we bring you a full story every Monday.